Hello and welcome to News Round, a recap of stories in the week. I'm Tenyo Lash Shoboale, the headlines. 13 years after its first presentation, National Assembly finally passes Petroleum Industry Bill into law. Federal High Court in Abuja grants federal government's request to detain leader of proscribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdi Kanu. The People's Democratic Party rejects President Mohamedou Buhari's nomination of Loretta Onyochie as National Commissioner of INEC takes protest to National Assembly. Plus, Ex-President Jacob Zuma sentenced to 15 months in jail by South Africa's top court. That's News Round in view. News Round begins in the National Assembly where a landmark was achieved with the passage of the Petroleum Industry Bill after more than 12 years. The bill seeks, among other things, to promote transparency, good governance and accountability in the administration of petroleum resources in Nigeria. It came following years of back and forth between the legislature and executive media campaigns and protests by civil rights groups. Presented to the National Assembly for the first time in 2008, the Petroleum Industry Bill is on the floor of the Green Chamber, this time for consideration. The chairman of the Ad Hoc Committee on PIB, Mr. Mohamed Mungano, makes an amendment to the clause for host communities. The rest of the consideration process is straightforward and the bill is passed. Thank you. Speaker of the House of Representatives applauds the passage of the PIB, assuring that similar attention would be given to the Electoral Amendment Bill. In the next couple of weeks, we're going on our summer vacation. Even with this piece of landmark legislation, we're going out on a high. In the Senate, the report on the bill is also under consideration after it was presented by the Joint Committee on Petroleum Downstream, Petroleum Upstream and Gas. Let's, let's be fair now. The report recommends amendments to a total of 752 provisions, out of which about 56 are substantial amendments. It also recommends the unbundling of the Nigeria National Petroleum Corporation from being a regulatory body to a limited liability company in which members of the public can hold shares, funding mechanism of 30% of NNPC Limited's profits to fund exploration of frontier basins across the country and 5% of the actual annual operating expenditure of the preceding financial year in the upstream petroleum operations affecting the host communities for funding of the host communities trust fund. Mr. President. But the Deputy Senate President, Senator Ove Omoagege, has some reservations. Mr. President, we don't want this money invested in midstream gas infrastructure. This is a penalty. There's a reason these companies have been penalized. This gas flaring is making people sick. It is damaging the environment. The remediation we seek is not construction of pipelines. It's not construction of gas infrastructure. We want that money to be used to ameliorate the condition. Then, the Minister of State for Petroleum Resources, okay. Chief Timmy Pre Silva, and the Group Managing Director of the NNPC, Mr. Mele Kari, are invited for a closed-door meeting. Moments later, the consideration of the bill resumes, with the President of the Senate putting each clause of the bill to vote. So those in favor that clause is one, two, three... And four, stand part of this bill, say aye. There was again saying the eyes have it. But a lawmaker from the Niger Delta region raises concern over a clause. We are talking about 5%. The 5% is not too much. The matter is put to vote. Those in favor of the amendment being sought by the DSP, say aye. Those again say nay. Yeah. The nays have it. And the outcome is still not favorable for the lawmakers from the Niger Delta region, and a call is made to divide the Senate. Mr. President, it doesn't matter. I am calling that 
Let the procedure for a division be taken and let's have a division. The matter is eventually resolved and the PIB is passed with the provision of 3% for host communities. While the passage of the PIB is considered a major breakthrough by the Ninth Assembly, Nigerians await what percentage would be eventually transmitted to the president as provision for host communities. 3% as passed by the Senate or 5% as passed by the House of Representatives. Emperor Simon, Channels Television News. Well, to the judiciary, after years of jumping bell, the leader of the prescribed indigenous people of Biafra, Namdu Kanu, has returned to the custody of the Department of State Services, DSS. This follows his rearrest and repatriation to the country this week. Upon his rearrangement, the Federal High Court in Abuja granted the request by the federal government to detain the IPOP leader ahead of the resumption of his trial. The Attorney General of the Federation and Minister of Justice, Mr. Abubakar Malami, the Inspector General of Police and members of the Department of State Service arrive for the news conference. It's a highly prioritized security briefing as the Minister of Justice announces the arrest of Namdi Kanu, the self-acclaimed leader of the indigenous people of Biafra. Self-acclaimed leader of the proscribed secessionist indigenous people of Biafra Namdi Kanu has, for your information, been intercepted through the collaborative efforts of the Nigerian Intelligence and Security Services. He has been brought back to Nigeria in order to continue facing trial after this affair while on bail regarding 11 count charge against him. Namdi Kanu was first arrested on October the 14th, 2015, on an 11-count charge including terrorism, treasonable felony, illegal possession of firearms, and publication of defamatory articles. He was later granted bail in April 2017 on health grounds after spending almost two years in detention. That bail was, however, revoked by the Federal High Court after the accused failed to appear in court. Kanu was later reported to have fled the country. The Minister of Justice says Kanu will now be made to continue his trial. Kanu is, as at now, being produced before Federal High Court in continuation of hearing of his case in respect of which he has evaded and indeed jumped bail. Moving swiftly to get the wheel of justice rolling again, the federal government rearranged Kanu before Justice Bintang Yako of the Federal High Court in Abuja. At the entrance of the court, heavily armed security operatives prevented journalists from entering into the courtroom. The federal government is here to ask the court for accelerated hearing and also to detain the accused in the DSS facility for security reasons, an application the court swiftly granted. And immediately, Namdi Kanu was moved to a DSS detention facility in Abuja. Namdi Kanu will be rearranged in court on July the 26th and 27th as against the initial adjournment date of October the 20th. Two political matters, the leadership of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, has stormed the National Assembly to demand for reversal of the president's nomination of Mrs. Loretta Onoche as a national commissioner of the Independent National Electoral Commission. PDP National Chairman Uche Sekondas, who led the group, described the nomination as a travesty on democracy. The bone of contention in the political sphere at the moment is the decision made by President Mohamed Buhari to pick Loretta Onochie, a member of the All Progressives Congress, as an INEC commissioner. The controversy is heightened by the fact that she also serves as a personal aide to the president. The challenge is... Human rights group Yaga Africa, along with others like it, reject the plan, describing it as a travesty to democratic principles. Mrs. Loretta does not meet the constitutional requirement of being non-partisan, as defined by Section 156 Sub 1A of the 1999 Constitution of the Federal Republic of Nigeria. She is not only a special assistant to the President on social media, she is also a card-carrying member of the ruling All Progressive Congress. Before now, 
The leadership of the People's Democratic Party, PDP, has spoken against the appointment and how it could affect the democratic process. Appeal to President Muhammad Buhari to rise above sentiment and do the needful. Go by the Constitution as President of Nigeria and not President of APC to withdraw the nomination of Loretta Onoche in the interest of this country. Determined to escalate the issue further and not mind in the rain, stalwarts of the PDP led by the chairman of the party stormed the National Assembly to air their frustration over the issue. Distinguished senators, members of House of Representatives, leaders of our party that are here, the youth and the women. We, represent them, we are here on this protest this day Stop pushing me. to make the final point Stop of me. total no, rejection to of Lorita Anoche. This letter will be presented immediately, right now, to the Senate Woo! President, a copy will also be given to uh, and Senator INEC. Gaia, the chairman of INEC. And uh, I can reassure you that justice will be done. As the matter goes on, it's left to see just how much pressure those opposing the move can put on the president to rescind the decision. Corruption, lack of accountability and transparency in contract negotiation process are major factors contributing to illicit financial flows in the country. Well, this is the view of the Vice President, Professor Yemi Oshibaju, when he declared open a two-day capacity building meeting for negotiators organized by the Independent Corrupt Practices and Other Related Offenses Commission in Abuja. Nigeria currently loses over $15 billion annually to illicit financial flows, and this is mostly through poorly negotiated bilateral agreements, tax evasion, among other factors, which is why this workshop is organized to strengthen the capacity of negotiators for improved terms of engagement with the rest of the world. One of the most important things in undertaking negotiations is preparation. That preparation, of course, means assembling a strong team. In the context of Nigeria, that means please call an interministerial meeting. Nigeria developed guidelines for the negotiations and drafting of agreements as far back as 1989. But 32 years down the line, it appears the document no longer holds sway. Sometimes political leaders who are not vast in the subject matter, they are the disruptors of, uh, they are the hindrance to the conclusion of very good agreement. The Vice President, Professor Yemio Shinbajo, who joins virtually to declare the meeting open, is concerned about the ineptitude of negotiators in bilateral agreements and contracts, which he says has cost Nigeria huge financial loss. There is no question at all that corruption plays a very huge role, which is why monitoring is important, which is why accountability is important. And those who draft contracts that eventually turn out uh, in this way ought to be held to account. There is a lack of transparency and, and, and uh, due process involved. Where, where commercial contracts go bad, that is. And this ranges from not advertising or opening up opportunities to other potential investors or not subjecting agreements to established uh, legislative and treaty ratification processes. On the ongoing discussion on climate change, the vice president says Nigeria's interest must be considered. The most important issue for us is that there must be a just transition from fossil fuels uh, to any type of clean energy. That just transition means that we must continue to use our gas. These countries cannot defund gas projects you know, while expecting us to uh, and, and expect us to cooperate or to be a part of the of the trial or, or to be a part of these uh, agreements, we cannot because this is existential for us. With this capacity building workshop, ICPC is optimistic that the challenge of illicit financial flows, which has seen Nigeria lose huge amount of money, would be curbed as negotiators would be well equipped with the right skills. 
Emperor Simon, Channel's Television News. When Newsround returns in just a moment, Nigerian Union of Journalists says over 300 press freedom violations recorded in the last five years. Please stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. A report put together by the Nigerian Union of Journalists has it that over 300 press freedom violations have been recorded in Nigeria in the last five years. During the presentation of the findings in Abuja, the president of the NUJ explained that the report indicates that journalists are now being deliberately uh, targeted because of the work they do. This forum is an attempt by the Nigerian Union of Journalists with support from some civil society organizations to document the violations against the media since 2015. According to the report, there have been about 300 press freedom violations in Nigeria, affecting about 500 journalists, media workers and media houses in the last five years from state and non-state actors. The violations range from arbitrary arrests and detentions, physical attacks, including attacks on media houses, threats and harassment. A good number of journalists have experienced lots of attacks. Some journalists have even lost their lives in the process. Some journalists have been incarcerated within the period under review. Some journalists have lost their jobs and all that. The report recommends improved welfare for workers in the media as well as deliberate steps to ensure the protection of the rights of journalists, especially in the line of duty. The recommendations that will come from this report should be something that the government should take very, very seriously as, also, as well as the general public. It is an opportunity for the Nigerian government to quickly retrace its step and join the rest of the world in, by starting, starting first to, to enact the Digital Rights Bill into law and then obey every court order regarding the rights of a journalist. Start with the compensation of the journalist. The Nigerian Press Council has a mandate to monitor the activities of the media in Nigeria as well as ensuring the protection of their rights. Unfortunately, the agency has not been effective in discharging its duty. The key players, the main stakeholders, the Newspaper Proprietors Association of Nigeria, the NUJ and the Guild of Editors refuse to appoint members to the board. And the board of the News Press Council is made up of essentially journalists, nobody else. The general consensus here is that violations against press freedom should be investigated to discourage violence against the media. The Chief Justice of Nigeria, Justice Tanka Mohammed, is appealing to the 18 newly sworn in justices of the Court of Appeal to avoid accepting juicy but destructive gifts while discharging their judicial functions. Justice Mohammed explains that such can land the judges into trouble while also reminding them to keep their heads above murky waters as their reputation matters in their rise to honour and fame. Members of the bar and bench, families of the new justices of the Court of Appeal at the swearing-in ceremony in Abuja. The Chief Justice of Nigeria and other justices of the Supreme Court arrive and immediately begin administering the oath of office on the new justices. Shortly after, he gives the new justices some advice, urging them to give good account of themselves. You must, against all odds, Conduct your affairs within the ambit of the law and the oath that has just been administered on you. If you are hitherto 50% under public scrutiny, I assure you now that it has risen to 100% by virtue of this elevation to the Court of Appeal. All eyes are on you. Others at the event believe that more justices should be appointed to expedite delivery of justice and a better judiciary. 
uh, this is a good thing to see. But I personally believe that we need more justices in all the courts, in all the appellate courts, the Court of Appeal and the Supreme Court even, and also more judges at the, all the high courts across this country. The judiciary is the cornerstone, is the backbone of our democracy. And we are aware of the challenges they are facing, including the challenge of manpower, of remuneration, of computerization, etc., etc. But this is a right step, and I believe at the end of the reforms, constitutional reforms, which will encompass judicial justice sector reforms, I believe that we will have a, a better judiciary. I think they must keep to the tenet and the conduct and ethics of that profession. Be very mindful that it's an opportunity given by God to decide the fate of human beings. So whatever you do, you will look at what God will, how God will judge you. The last swearing-in of justices into the Court of Appeal was in 2012, and to many, the swearing-in of these justices comes at a time when several litigations are on the waiting list. Railway vandals will have to face the wrath of the law as the Minister of Transportation is recommending manslaughter charge for such persons. Mr. Rotimi Amechi made this recommendation during the weekly ministerial media briefing at the State House, where he argued that stricter enforcement of the law on vandalism would stop frequent theft of railway sleepers and consequently loss of lives. Nigeria's transport infrastructure became central at this week's ministerial briefing at the State House. The Minister of Transport first urges the law to prevail on railway vandals as the federal government intensify efforts towards securing more railway facilities across the country. It takes about 800 meters for a, real, a, a, a locomotive to stop. As it's running now, it's running with speed. The moment it wants to stop, the, the driver will apply brake here, and you take 800 meters to stop. So how will the driver know that you have removed, vandalized a track 800 meters away? He will not know until he gets to the track. So when he gets to the track, what happens? He applies brake, right? He needs 800 meters to stop. So once he gets to that track that has been vandalized, he will derail. Once he derails, what happens? People may die. And each coach takes 85 persons. So what happens? You would have killed... And there, there, sometimes there are about 14, 20 coaches. So imagine how many persons that could die as a result of that derailment, just because one selfish Nigerian is trying to steal tracks to make money. I think, like other countries, I don't, I'm not saying they should be killed because there's poverty. But I'm saying they, they should be charged for mass, mass slaughter because people could die. Through the lens of Chinese technology, the transport minister assures that Nigeria will begin to assemble and then manufacture its own coaches. They are building a factory, and I hope that by December we should be able to commission that factory. And I've told them they have to hurry, because they've supplied us 15% of the wagons. They need to supply us 85. And that 85 will be assembled in, in Nigeria, in Kajola. They've also agreed in writing that after five years, they will start, instead of assembling, they will start producing. Then they will graduate from there to building a factory to produce locomotives and coaches. They further disclosed that the Kaduna Kano Railway is built to be flagged off in two weeks, while the Lekki Deep Sea Port will be completed before the end of the present administration. The security and economic impact of transport infrastructure is quite profound and this is perhaps why the federal government is considering exploring the option of borrowing from European banks to finance some of these projects, you know, to ultimately crystallize infrastructure development in the country. From the presidential villa, Gloria Umizuki, Channels Television News. News round ends in South Africa, where former President Jacob Zuma has been sentenced to 15 months in jail by the highest court in the country. The sentence comes after the Constitutional Court found him guilty of contempt for the fine its order to appear as an investigation into alleged corruption while he was president. In the final analysis... The Constitutional Court makes the following order. One, the application for direct access is granted. Two, the Helen Sussman Foundation is admitted as amicus curiae. Three, 
It is declared that Mr. Jacob Gelechegi Sazuma is guilty of the crime of contempt of court for failure to comply with the order made by this court in Secretary of the Judicial Commission of Inquiry into allegations of state capture, corruption and fraud in the public sector, including organs of state, versus Jacob Gelechegi Sazuma. Mr. Jacob for Mr. Jacob Gelechegi Sazuma is sentenced to undergo 15 months imprisonment. Five, Mr. Jacob Gelechegi Sazuma is ordered to submit himself to the South African police at Nkandla Police Station or Johannesburg Central Police Station within five calendar, calendar days from the date of this order. And that's news round this week. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Tenyo Lashibo Ale. Enjoy the rest of your weekend.